All right. So, uh, where were we? Oh, uh, I was talking about uh, occasionally we'd have to work as role players for other groups. Right. And we were detailed out to the 4th Infantry Division. And we were supposed to surrender. We had our Soviet uniforms and fake weapons. And normally it went pretty well. Uh, we'd be captured and searched and tied up. And uh, it, it'd take us quite a little bit of time to get back to the point where we'd be interrogated. And this was the part that was good for our information. Uh, knowing that a person captured on the front line, uh, oftentimes it'd be 12, 14, 16 hours before they ended up in front of an interrogator. Uh, and so it was crucial that we had to break them early to get that information. Because as I said before, uh, 24 to 48 hours, the information's no good. Uh, but in this case, uh, I had to break character. Uh, we'd been captured, and this young lieutenant, brand new lieutenant, uh, uh, boy, he was very anti-Russian and, and just pumped. And he got to the point where he, he started pushing us around a little bit. And I, I began to get a little worried that he was going a little too far. And so I broke character, and, and I, I reminded him that we are indeed Americans role-playing. And he, he backed off, and, and things were good. But uh, on a different exercise that was very similar, we, we had quite a good laugh because uh, our battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, he had seen some of the work we were doing, and he, he was just excited about it, and he asked if, if he could come along with us. And we said, sure, we'd love to have you, sir. And so we, we put him in a uniform, and to sort of, we were worried that word would get out that, you know, the battalion commander was going to be one of the role players. And so we, we switched the Soviet rank. We gave him, we made him a sergeant. And we took one of our older sergeants and we, we made him an actual Russian colonel. And so when we got captured uh, for the exercise, uh, they, they came in and, and they, for whatever reason, they, they took our colonel, who was actually one of our senior sergeants, uh, off and they put him in a separate cell and they treated him very, very well. And uh, our actual lieutenant colonel, our battalion commander, uh, he, he got pushed, pushed around and then pushed down into the mud and worked over pretty well. And uh, he, he when, had a blast. He, when he you say that. worked over pretty well, what do you mean? Uh, well, as much as the interrogators are very gentle not to you know, break Geneva Conventions, uh, our, our line troops sometimes could be a little rough, uh, partly because their concern was that nobody gets hurt, uh, if, especially if it was a real event. And to see someone surrendering with a weapon, uh, they usually take you down pretty hard, uh, remove the weapon. When you say take you down pretty hard, what do you mean you by that? You throw you on the ground and, and press you down. And, and uh, We all used to carry the zipper strips, uh, the little, I don't know even know what they're called, the little black bands instead of handcuffs. Okay. You just put them yep. through and you, you zip, zip ties. Uh, and usually the infantry guys would, would throw you down on the ground pretty hard and usually put a knee in your back. and. Pull your hands behind your back with a tie, and uh, then search your uniform. Open it up, search your uniform, check for any weapons or anything dangerous, uh, check for ID. Uh, and then a lot of times they'd be a little rough getting you where you're supposed to be, uh, especially if you resisted or didn't comply. Uh, I, I never saw anything that would border on criminal, just a little rough. Uh, and, and our lieutenant colonel, uh, the actual lieutenant colonel, uh, I, I think he resisted a little bit. I uh, wasn't used to being. I pushed around, and uh, so he, he got uh, zipper cuffed and, and pushed in the mud a little bit and, and searched pretty hard. Um, and by the end of the day, he was he was just so happy. He had a lot of fun, and and uh, this was his idea of a good time. That was his idea of a good time. Being manhandled. Yeah, uh, and uh, and for from his perspective, he spent a lot of time you know supervising from a pretty high level, and to get down in the dirt with what his guys are actually doing and going through. Uh, he learned a lot. Uh, he had a, a few changes that he wanted to make in procedure that were well thought out. And uh, from our perspective, we gained a lot of respect for him. Uh, he was a good officer, and, and he wasn't afraid to get out with us. Uh, we'd run into him a lot in the motor pool, working on trucks and whatnot as well. Uh, he's a good man. Now, at this point, your rank was? Uh, I was a specialist, E4. Uh, I, uh, by the time I got to my unit, I was already a private first class. And then while at the unit, I was prone to specialist. Uh, because we spend so much time in training, 
a lot of the guys tend to have higher rank. Uh, but there's not a lot of promotion into the NCOs, like sergeants and stuff. Uh, so I went to the board, and I passed, and I was promotable to sergeant if I had stayed in. I would have been promoted, but instead I decided to get out. So the uh, during what do you remember most from that that period in in uh, in Germany? Germany was great. Uh, again, we were for a long time. The U.S. felt this is where the major war would be. Mm -hmm. uh, the Soviets coming across the gap and and us having to stop them. And so there were a lot of opportunities. There was a lot of good training. We worked a lot with our allies. Uh, there were a lot of fun things. Uh, I, I remember a lot of my, my good buddies in the unit, you know, they didn't want to have to go anywhere if they didn't have to. And some of myself and some of my friends, we'd volunteer. And one of the cases I remember the best is they, they came down and they asked for volunteers uh, to go to Holland, the Netherlands, to go and pick up some trucks. Uh, we were phasing out our two and a half ton trucks and replacing with uh, five tons. And so I volunteered immediately. I figured a trip to the Netherlands and drive some trucks back. Uh, the only problem we had is I wasn't licensed on the new trucks. And we didn't have any of them. And so I had been licensed on the, the two and a half ton. And so they sent us to the, the motor pool. And they brought out the five ton tow truck. And we, we each took a lap around the motor pool in the five ton truck and, and he licensed us. And then we went up to the Netherlands and we picked up our trucks and had to drive them back. About a 14 hour drive in, in trucks that we barely knew how to operate. Uh, but they were, they were good, good quality. So we had a lot of fun with that and we had a chance to uh, hang out with some of the Dutch units up there that were giving us the trucks. Uh, so we, we had fun like that. I think the other big impression that I had was especially the older generation of Germans were very, very thankful. Uh, very grateful towards us. Uh, a, a funny incident that happened, my, my friend Tony, uh, Tony was uh, Mexican-American, I used to spend a lot of time with, and we would explore the, the downtown area of where we lived in Darmstadt, Germany, and looking for smaller bars and, and restaurants off the beaten trail uh, to stay away from you know the soldiers' clubs and whatnot. And we rolled into this one bar one night, and we were fascinated they had all these stuffed animal heads and hunting rifles on the walls and a very a much older group of people in there and so we walked in went to the bar and for whatever reason we ordered we ordered vodka that night and a couple of the older German men looked at us and uh, the one leaned over and asked us in German uh, are you Russian and we said no we're not Russians we're Americans and he got very excited, and, and he got up and he walked off. And he came back a few minutes later with this uh, elderly woman. Uh, and she, uh, she must have been 80 probably. And a, a bunch of the other German men had gathered around. And this woman told us, she, she spoke English. Uh, it was a bit rusty, but her English was good. That she had been an English teacher before World War II. And so the men at the bar had elected her to be their translator so they could talk to us. And they, they thanked us for the American service in, in World War II and for freeing the country from Hitler. And we just had, a, it was an incredible night. There were, you know, tears in everybody's eyes and, and you know, just genuine appreciation. Uh, and, and we were, we felt very humble, you know, because we were just continuing in a line of, of where a lot of other Americans had been. Uh, but to these you know, people, it meant so much, and they wanted to thank us for being there to help protect Germany. Uh, it meant a lot to us. Uh, Were you surprised at the idea that they'd be thankful for America's role during in defeating their country? I, I was, and part of it was from being, you know, a 21-year-old young man. Uh, I didn't think to that point. And most of the Germans that I interacted with were young people uh, who, in many cases, sort of took it for granted this is what life is now. And, and a lot of their experiences were with Americans who hung out at the you know, American clubs and uh, sometimes took advantage of you know, the, the Germans and 
and, and stuff like that. And to come into contact with the, the older generation and to talk to them was, was very rewarding. And it really had a lasting impact. Uh, along a similar line, one that was to me a little bit almost sort of scary. Uh, I was traveling through Baden-Baden, uh, a little resort town in Germany, and I, I stopped at a hotel. And as I was in there, I, I met the hotel owner older German man, heavy set man, and we were talking and uh, he looked at my, I had a high and tight haircut and he asked, he said, are you American military? I said, yes. So at that point I'd learned German pretty well. So we talked a little bit in German and he asked me, he said, well, what do you, what do you do? And we weren't, normally we weren't really supposed to tell him we're in intelligence, uh, that sometimes would worry people and, and get phone calls. And so usually I would just say, well, I'm, I'm a, a paratrooper. Uh, airborne and he said oh and he used a word in German that I hadn't heard he, he said yeah uh, ich war in Fallschirmspringer auch uh, except instead of using the, instead of saying I was a paratrooper also he used the older word he, he called himself a Fallschirmjäger instead of Fallschirmspringer and I didn't think much of it we talked for a while and then uh, when I went home I I looked it up and I talked to some of our German linguists about it and they were really impressed because I hadn't realized the Germans in World War II knew that we were going to have an airborne drop and use paratroopers against them. And so they created a special unit called parachute hunters who would go out and seed the battlefields with spikes and wait for paratroopers to come in so they could kill them. And as soon as I learned about that, it sent chills up my spine. Because here I was as a young airborne soldier meeting one of the old generation of the parachute hunters. Uh, it, it was really chilling. Uh, but it was also fascinating to, to sit and speak with them for a while with no, no ill will. Uh, we were just two men talking, you know, a soldier and a veteran. Uh, it was really interesting. The, the, the earlier group that you had talked about, the... Uh... Do you think that because of the, the Soviet occupation of East Germany mm -hmm. that that had driven home to that generation that uh, to a very large extent America's, uh, the troops that you represented and others had since the, the, the fall, you know, had uh, prevented the Russians from taking the rest of Germany and the rest of Europe. Yeah, very much so. Uh, I think especially West Germany well, and East Germany too uh, knew what the Soviets were capable of. Uh, there was no love for the Russians uh, and there was a lot of respect and, and thanks to the Allied soldiers who were, were helping defend against Russia. Uh, and I think you're very much right. Uh, there was a lot of people worried about the Russians. Uh, yeah. And plus, you know, that was uh, pretty much the height of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though uh, the Gulf thing, uh, you know, was going on, still, uh, you know, there, there, there were, you know, concerns as to, you know, um, what was going to happen over on, on the other, other side. Yeah, well, I was there. Uh, I guess technically the Cold War ended, uh, although it, it, it took a while to all break apart. Uh, and we saw quite a lot of changes. Uh, for example, Eastern Europe broke away. And some of the countries, for example, Poland and Czechoslovakia, uh, very quickly wanted to become allies with Western Europe. And so we, we dealt with a little bit of that. And then, of course, with the, the Russians pulling out. And eventually that was why, you know, as one of the reasons why I didn't stay in is they were cutting all the bonuses for re-enlisting uh, for Russian linguists. They, they didn't feel that they needed them anymore. Uh, but, you know, there were some interesting events I was able to take part in. I was able to travel to Czechoslovakia and I went with uh, some friends and took the train into Czechoslovakia and all the way into what, what's now Moravia, uh, Brno City. 
And while I was there was when they had the historic splitting of Czech Republic and Slovakia. Mm -hmm. So I entered Czechoslovakia and then I left the Czech Republic. Uh, and to me, it, it, that was a huge symbol of, of the, the ending of the Cold War and that things are going to be different. Uh, and I know within a very short time after I left, uh, they pulled out uh, more than half of the troops out of Germany. Uh, we had two corps, or two armies, 5th and 7th at the time in Germany, and shortly after I left, they took one of those out. Uh, so it really was on that cusp of, of change. Uh, of course, the military after that had to restructure a lot. Uh, and then what was the feeling among the Germans and then, you know, among the Czechs about, you know, this, what was going on? Among the Czechs, uh, I had quite a few friends who were Czechs, there was a, a big feeling of hope uh, that now we can get rid of the Soviet system and take care of ourselves. Uh, and I think if we look at Czech Republic today, they're, they're doing very well. Uh, they're creating, you know, very good trade relations and, and they're doing very well. Among my German friends, there was a, a strong fear of more foreigners coming in and hurting the German economy, taking German jobs. Uh, while I was there, we ran into several times instances of racism. Uh, there was a, a very, very strong dislike in Germany of Turks, of Gypsies, uh, of Russians. Uh, and we ran into it a few times. I remember a, one of my friends was so mad. I used to hang out with the Mexican-American group. Uh, one of my very, very good friends, uh, Fernando Ruiz, uh, we went out one night, Fernando and Tony, another Mexican-American, and myself, uh, big dark hair, and we went to this club and knocked on the door, and they opened, it was old, old school, they opened a little peephole and looked out at him, and the man at the door said, you know, can I, can rouse? And I hadn't heard that word before, and, and my friend Fernando just, just about went ballistic. Oh, he started yelling, he pounded on the door, and, so we grabbed him, we, we pulled him out, and we said, eh, they don't want us in there, man, we, we don't want to go in. And he said, yeah, but he, he called me a kanaka, which was a, apparently a filthy word for, for foreigners. And, and he said, I, I'm not a kanaka, I'm a I'm Mexican. And he wanted them to know that, that, you know, he's American and he's Mexican and he's not a, you know, whatever else they were trying to pinhole him as. And you know, we decided it would be the better part of valor to get out of that place. Uh, but we ran into a lot of places that some would have signs uh, that basically said, if you're not German, you're not welcome here. Uh, we ran into some skinheads, there were quite a few at the time. Uh, and we, we didn't get too involved with them. We didn't like them very much. But, so we saw that undercurrent in Germany as well, uh, this fear of, of foreign interaction. Uh, loss of jobs, uh, and that was, that was coming along, and, and I've followed, you know, Germany since then, and their economy's still doing pretty well, but there has been a lot of issues uh, with immigration. Going on. There, there was also the uh, concern within Ger Germany with the unification yeah. with East Germany, uh, you know, the, a certain number of yeah. East Germans, because of their years under the Soviet system, uh, didn't necessarily understand that, you know, freedom also means, you know, rolling up your sleeves and achieving. Yeah, and you're very right on that. That's, that's really a good statement. Uh, and we saw among a lot of our younger German friends too, West German, uh, there was this feeling of if we reunite with East Germany, why do we have to pay for them to come up to our standard of living? It wasn't our fault. Where the older Germans tend to feel we're all Germans. We take care of one another. Uh, and, and this is why I've, I've been concerned. Of course, I, after I got out of the service, I spent some time in Korea. And I've been concerned a lot of the rhetoric about, well, you know, unification of Korea would be like the unification of Germany. And there's a lot of concerns there uh, with this whole... Again, you've got one side that's much wealthier and, and has worked hard to get where they are, 
feeling that maybe they shouldn't have to pay for this other group. Uh, and an older generation that wants a reunification very much so. Uh, so I think it's worth studying. If Korea thinks about reunifying, they need to look at some of the issues that Germany faced as well. Not just the good, but the bad. The, now, when you were in the Czech Republic, uh, did you go to, what city did, were you visiting? I, I, I spent most of my time in a, a very small town called uh, Morovská Trebova, uh, which was a small industrial town. Uh, and I passed through the city of Brno, and, and I spent uh, a day in uh, Pilsen, the capital of the Czech Republic. Uh, but I, I was in a nice small factory town, and I got to meet a lot of just everyday ordinary Czechs. And before I went there, it was interesting, because again, my, my language was Russian, uh, that I'd studied, and I cross-trained in Czech and German. And the friend that I went with was a Czech national, and he said, uh, now make sure, because we would communicate in Russian, because he spoke Russian. Of course, they were forced to learn Russian. And he said, now when we go there, I'm going to ask you, don't speak Russian at all. He said, because my friends and family hate the Russians, and it'll make them really upset. I said, well, how are we going to communicate? He said, well, a lot of them speak some English, they speak some German, uh, your check is getting pretty good, uh, we'll, we'll make it work. And I think there's some maxim to the, the poorer that people are, the greater the generosity. Uh, and when I was there, they, they didn't have a lot, uh, but they, they fed me and entertained me and took me in and, and treated me so, so very generously. Uh, just wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, we had a really good time there. What was their view of Americans? They loved Americans. Uh, the Czechs that I, I worked with and dealt with uh, were more saddened that the U.S. couldn't have protected them from the Soviets. And when the you know, Czech Revolution 68, uh, they asked the U.S. for help. And uh, right up to this day, the, the Czechs have, have stood by the U.S. and said, you know, we want to be your friends. Uh, the people that I talked to loved Americans, I wanted to work well with the U.S., and I think we see that today, uh, the Czech's position, Czech Republic's position, uh, as far as like with NATO and, and support in the U.S. and stuff, and Poland, of course, are very similar, uh, so. I mean, <clears throat> the, you know, for a lot of Americans, uh, You know, you were probably too young to really notice when you were in high school, uh, you know, but a lot of Americans were like, well, what, what's really the difference between the Russians and, and the U.S.? Why do we have to have all these nuclear weapons? Why, you know, can't we all just hug each other and be friends and uh, disarm and, uh, and <clears throat> you know, uh, someone like yourself who you know, <clears throat> was there and, and, you know, saw both the before and after uh, of the fall of the, the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. the, you know, what, what do you say to those people who, you know, uh, at various times over the previous 40 years were, you know, wondering whether it was worth all the American treasure to mm -hmm. defend Europe and, you know, and who thought it was terrible that um, Americans were, you know, ready to go to war with uh, the Soviets? Yeah, good question. Uh, I'm grateful that the U.S. was willing to do so, uh, partly because I think history bears it out. Uh, when we let slip the protective barrier around Korea in 51, uh, we saw the, the death and destruction that was rained upon uh, South Korea and, and Americans fighting there. Uh, and I think if we had backed off during the Cold War from Germany, I think we would have invited the Soviets in. Uh, whether they would have or not, I don't know. Uh, but I don't think we could have taken that chance. Uh, I also think we, we also gained a lot out of it. I think we gained very good cooperation and friendship with European countries. Uh, I think if we look today, uh, economically, I think our positions are very good. We work very well with Europe. Uh, but to look at the Cold War and the amount we expended, 
I think it was worth it. I think we had to do it because if we hadn't and something had happened, we would have regretted it. And it would have cost us a lot more in the long run. Uh, at the same time, it, some aspects of the Cold War were good, I guess, uh, especially after Sputnik and the U.S. decided to invest a lot more money into education. Uh, I think that was an advantage. Uh, the military growth also provided a lot of jobs and training for our Americans. I think that was a positive benefit. Uh, but in the end, it was worth it, I think. What lessons did you draw from your military service? Well, a lot, uh, especially on, on a personal level, I think there were a lot of really, really good things. Work ethic. Uh, doesn't matter how you're feeling, doesn't matter what your mood is, doesn't matter doesn't matter what, you get up and you do your job. Uh, you do what you're supposed to. Um, you show up early. Uh, early is on time. Uh, be professional in what you do. Uh, pay close attention to everything you're doing. Uh, because hopefully now as, as a teacher, you know, lives don't will depend on, on it. But at the same time, everything's got to be, got to be right. Do what you're supposed to. Keep accountability of now instead of my team members, I keep accountability of my students um, and my teachers that I work with. Uh, so a lot of it parallels. Uh, on a broader sense, I think it was really good, you know, when I was an 18-year-old kid uh, who wanted to get out of the North Country, I think it would have been very easy to, to move somewhere that would have been very similar. Uh, but instead, you know, I was given sort of the bug to get out and see new things and try new things. Uh, which has been good. Uh, it's led me to you know, travel to a lot of countries around the world and get to know a lot of different people. Uh, that would probably be the biggest things. And I, Well, actually, probably the, the very biggest thing would be an appreciation for my country. Um, you know, knowing that at, at any point while I was active or the four years inactive that followed, uh, I could be called up and required to put my life on the line uh, for my country. Uh, and that's pretty sobering. Uh, you know, when you, you listen to the, the rhetoric, you know, that goes on today, whether, it, you know, political parties fighting or contemporary issues, it makes you appreciate that everything fits into a system. You know, the, the Constitution that we have and the opportunities that we provide for all of our people is worth protecting, is worth dying for whether you agree with everything or not, that those basic elements, you know, freedom of speech, you know, those little things, great things, that's what's worth it. And I think by the time I got out of the service, I appreciated it more and more. And so when I have family members who serve, or friends who serve, or just see on TV people serving, you appreciate it, what they're giving up. And what they might lose. Yeah. Is there anything that I haven't covered that you want to bring up? Nothing I can think of. Uh, again, it was it was great. Oh, I guess the only thing I would add is after I got out, uh, I did use my education benefits, and I went to college. Uh, I was first in my family to go to college and graduate. Although my sisters were right close behind me, uh, they actually got scholarships. Uh, and then following that, I, I had the bug to travel and went to Korea and worked for four years and came back and used up the last of my education benefits uh, to get my master's degree, and now I teach social studies. Uh, and a lot of this, you know, from a, a four-year period of active duty in the military, it, it's, it spans a lifetime. Because as I'm talking to students and, you know, we're studying history in class or... You know, kids come asking questions about what to do after high school or they're talking about their parents or brothers or sisters. Uh, it, it gives me a chance to relate and share what I've learned, uh, for better or worse. Uh, so I think that would be about it. Well, thank you very, very much for taking the time to come over and share with us a little bit about your career and the service. And uh, we'll be...
providing this to the uh, Veterans Museum in Saratoga, and uh, you know it, it's interesting. You know the the service stories have spanned. You know from yesterday, I was talking to a gentleman who stormed the beach in Normandy, uh, and then had to disarm landmines with uh, a bayonet. A gentleman who was the bodyguard for the chief prosecutor during the Nuremberg war trials. Uh, you know, guys in Korea, guys in uh, you know just about every conflict and and the Cold War as well. And, and you know, someone who you know was there during the fall of of the Soviet Union. You know, pretty much spans the period. So I want to thank you for coming over and.